our first show of 2022, and we're talking about colonialism and history, plain old American history, not critical race theory, plain old American history with Asians in it on a Mila Mux takeout. <laughs> Hi, it's Emil, Emil Guillermo, Emil Amuck to you, your host for Emil Amuck's Takeout, the podcast, our takes on all things considerable. You can catch the live stream Monday through Friday, 2 p.m. Pacific, live on YouTube or on Facebook Watch or EmilGuillermo.media on Facebook or on Twitter at Emil Amuck, E-M-I-L-A-M-O-K or later recorded on amok.com that's the live stream it's different from this show this is the podcast the the classic version not live sometimes edited available on apple itunes spotify iheart so the live show you can hear show 213 our new year's eve show where i review 2021 I suggest that maybe you become the New Year's baby, have your own rebirth this year. And I talk generally about my columns on the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund blog. That's at aldef, A-L-D-E-F dot org slash blog. But this show is different. This is the first of 2022. You know, there are new laws in the most Asian state in the nation. Starting this year, ethnic studies will be formally starting up in the community colleges and it will be a requirement starting in 2024. There's another new law that impacts high schools in California, which must be ready to have ethnic studies starting in the 2025, 2026 semesters. And there's going to be a graduation requirement for high schools in the 2029, 2030 year. You, you might've thought that maybe this has already happened, but no, this is, is a new law as of January 1st, 2022. And keep in mind, it's not critical race theory. It's just history, a full rendering of American history and all its peoples. And it's about time. People should know all this stuff. And of course, this legislation in California, it really should be the model for other states. But it's funny. A funny thing happened to one Oakland student who graduated two years ago, and she got into Harvard. And there she found she wasn't able to take a course in Tagalog or Filipino, Filipino classes. They didn't have any. And that was just the beginning. This year, Eleanor Wickstrom got a colonial education when she herself learned the history of Harvard's role in the U.S. colonization of the Philippines. As an editor of the student newspaper, the Harvard Crimson, her opinion piece was one of the most read articles in December, exposing the little known history of Harvard and its role in educating the Filipinos. The head of education was one Fred W. Atkinson, a young Harvard graduate appointed by President Taft. Atkinson's charge was to give the Filipinos English and teach them their history with a book written by a white man, David Prescott Barrows, who saw the Filipinos as illiterate savages. Barrows later would become the president of UC Berkeley. Recently, they stripped his name from one of the more prominent buildings on campus. For Wickstrom, discovering these open secrets of history was a revelation. She writes, of the jagged wound that is U.S. colonialism in the Philippines, a gun is smoking in Harvard's hands. In her essay, she writes of the scars of colonization, and I could relate. More than 40 years earlier, when I was a young Harvard student, I, I had a similar experience when I went deep into the stacks of wider library. Here's my conversation with Harvard Crimson editor and writer Eleanor Wickstrom. And she does talk. I mean, I, I get into it uh, a little bit early, but she does tell me her story. So hang in there. Elner Wickstrom on a meal amongst takeout. I'm just going to start uh, the conversation. Anyway, look, right. it, it was really nice seeing the piece. I was just, 
you know, damn those algorithms. I was just, <laughs> they, they, they give me uh, Harvard stuff, uh, you know, because I was, I read something in the Harvard, in the Crimson Magazine about the KKK being at Harvard in 1924 yes. or five, yeah. you know, which I found interesting because, I didn't know that. I mean, I you know, I I knew they had a streak. They they had a, they were aligned somehow. But mm-hmm. I didn't know. You know, those pictures are really wild. And so, um, so I, the algorithm feed gives me all this hard stuff. And then I, yeah. I was reading actually about quantum physics, about this new piece of matter. Yes. And I thought, <laughs> you know, because that's an Asian thing, right? I mean, I'm not. I I don't like. I'm not a physics <laughs> guy. I'm not a physics. I like physics for the metaphor. Yes, it's, it's a great, I, exactly. <laughs> great metaphor, but don't don't make me co- computate anything, you yeah. know. So I was reading it, and then I said, "Oh well, get down to the bottom." You know, most read, right? Mm-hmm. And I see your article, Harvard's role in, in U.S. colonialism in the Philippines. And I, that's that's popular today. I mean, that's my. <laughs> I started laughing, and then I, well, no offense, I, I just said, no, no. you know, like, we should know this, right? We should know about this. And then I, so I went to it, and it said, then I see the article, and it said, yesterday, meaning that it's fresh, that this wasn't like something that Harvard finally discovered 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50, you know, it. it's like, it is now kind of like right in their face. And you wrote it, and I thought, "Wow, I I got to talk to this this woman. I got <laughs> got to talk to this writer, because it's like um, I your your first line got to me. First of all, Eleanor, welcome to the program. Thank you. This Thank is you um, and this is a meal amongst takeout. It is Christmas time that we're talking. So my gong has a garland, a real. Uh, you can tell it's from." Maginda now because it's got the bump and uh and i'm you know it, it, we're, so it's festive here because it's christmas filipinos love no paroles here just you know we're just kind of scanning. actually i have a parole in my bedroom yeah uh, don't tell me that you're embarrassing me for not having a parole <laughs> <laughs> all right so anyway so your article scars of empire harvard's role in u.s colonial colonialism in the philippines i i started reading it and I was just, I was floored by it. Harvard's legacy of empire and education is one haunted by loss. The instrument used to create this wound lies directly in the university's hands. But without Harvard, irony of ironies, right? I wouldn't be able to begin putting some of these pieces together. I mean, this is kind of like, you got to go to the doors of hell in order to find the, the keys, right? There. And, but you're there. You're there. And, and that's the way I felt almost 50 years ago. And, I was, and then I said, there's, a, there's someone there now doing this? I, so I read, and your first line, the, the last time I called Harvard a colonizer, it was a joke. Mostly this time it's not. And I told my first Harvard is colonizer joke in 1977. <laughs> So it was still a joke, but I had to tell it as a joke because they they couldn't take it otherwise, right? And so, and like you, I had the same kind of journey going deep into the stacks. I wasn't worried about colonization, though. I wasn't worried about the war. I just wanted to find out about my father, right? He came in the 20s. Why was his life so different than all my other Filipino friends who had normal (laughs) normal middle-class American lives or normal American lives or my other non-Filipino friends. And it was because my father came in the twenties from the Philippines on a boat on a dollar steamship. And you know, the, the, the weird wacky sex ratios, 14 to one men to women that defined my life. Right. And he was there only because he did well in his American education in a locus norte in the Philippines Thanks, of course, to Harvard, right? So, mm-hmm. so it's just, um, it's funny. I mean, I that story has stuck with me. I still write about it. I still talk about it. And so when I see you coming around, writing about it now, it's like, 
this is unfinished business, right? Yes. I mean, it just hasn't, we have not resolved this, no matter how many generations. And so I said, I've got to get Eleanor Wickstrom on with that great Filipino name. It is Filipino, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, um, the name and tradition of having like two first names, mother's middle name, or mother's last name is middle name. Yeah. But, I mean, that was also a Spanish thing, I guess, but still a Filipino name in that sense. Yeah. And, and I noticed when I, you always use the V in your byline and yeah. then I guess it was your mother or your sister used the V when she put the byline mm -hmm. on the, on the picture. And I thought, Thank you. I thought, Oh, well, okay. She's, she doesn't want to give away the, the mother's maiden name banking secret, <laughs> <laughs> but, but you do have a, your mother's Filipino and, mm -hmm. and your father is from, I guess, is he from just, American? Yep, just like stock American white. Stock American white. And that that's funny. And and so their story, you and you know, you're a journalist, right? You're at the Crimson, a Crimson editor heading up the the editorial comp, mm -hmm. which is no big it's it's no small deal. It's a big deal. And so uh you know that just saying a name and an age are just two facts that you can just run with. Mm -hmm. And so just by saying your name, Eleanor Villafranca Wickstrom, there's a lot of facts there and a lot of assumptions, a lot of paths to get to mm -hmm. more. But anyway, uh, I just, uh, how is Harvard these days for a Filipino American like yourself? Um, I would say that the community is small but mighty. That's the, the biggest way that I would characterize it. There's a pretty, is a tight knit Philippine forum. Um, we actually had a holiday party right before we left where I taught everyone how to make lumpia and we had a, a really? nice um, white elephant moment going on. So I think that like coming into the space and I talked about it a bit in the article, I did a lot of what I could to see what was gonna be available to me. Um, one, definitely seeing that like structurally in terms of curriculum that there wasn't going to be a lot going on but I did make sure to like look and see what was there in terms of um community building and so HPF which is what the forum goes by um has been a pretty it's been a pretty solid place for undergraduates it also brings in a couple of graduates as well um and it's looped into D1 which is the bigger Filipino organization within the Boston area and so we have a lot of nice connections with like BU or Boston College um that I think it makes it it's obviously different coming from the West Coast, right? Where there's like yeah. such a strong Filipino presence into like the frigid air of Boston, where it's like not very, not very amenable to, you know, island sensibilities, but like, <laughs> it's a good time. Yeah. I mean, so you can imagine what it must have been like when I got there uh, almost, almost uh, 50 years ago, right? I mean, where you, you go into a place and you, you have a last name like mine and they think, oh, well, maybe Hispanic. Oh, well, no, or well, maybe Asian. I mean, they, they don't, they don't know. And then Asians, if you've read Dean uh, Henry Rosovsky's book, you know, he talks about, well, you know, the Filipinos, they're different from the other Asians. They're more like the blacks and more like the Hispanics. And so it was totally, totally alienating for someone like me from the West coast. And so I, you know, I decided to ask you about how it is now. And boy, if I had just, it was almost like my experience going back to Harvard in the 70s must have been like the continuation of my father's journey from Ilocos Norte to San Francisco, where every Filipino you see, you feel a kind of kinship mm. and you feel like, oh, Filipino. Oh, you know, I stopped doing that now because it's annoying to some people <laughs> when they... When I do the, oh, Filipino, but yeah. it, it was a thing. You go to a, you go to a place and you see another Filipino and then you just look at him, you know. I would say actually it's definitely still a thing. Is that, it? Really? That we, yeah. So my mom jokes that she has a Filipino dar. So like yeah. she's the radar, you get the last name. You're like <laughs> this. I know that there is something fishy going on here. I know I'm sensing a little bit of Filipino-ness, um, but yeah. the same thing on campus, just because like the undergrad community, there's, I'd say like. 15 is like a, a benchmark estimate for how many of us there are in a, like an undergrad population of 5,000 people. It's not very many. Yeah. Um, so I'll walk around and I'll see like last names um, and I'll be like, this, this is, it's giving a little bit, you yeah. know, 
tell me where exactly are your parents from? <laughs> well, well, th- that's what that's what it gets into. So you, so I see Villa Franca, and I say, okay, kind of. And you mentioned your article. Your mother's from. I would. I was guessing Manila. Yeah. Yeah. Right outside of Manila. Right. Right outside of Manila. And my, you know, and my mother, uh, she was from Tondo, but mm-hmm. my father was from Ilocos. So it was the Ilocano and the T- Tagalog together. So we were alienated from each other. Right. Right. We. So we had. So the only thing we did was talk bad accented English. That was what we did <laughs> until. Till I I can uh, like figure my way out of, of, about that, but but you know it's it, it's true. You you go to a place like uh, like Harvard or you go to any place, and uh, it was like my father's experience of the way you get a, a Lola or the way you get a Lola because I never had a Lola, yeah. right? Because uh, my parents my parents parents never came to to America. So it was always like the older Irish family that lived next door to their San Francisco flat. They became my Lola and Lolo, and we had Thanksgiving dinner with them because they had the turkey and we had the we had the pork, I guess, or we had something else. But this is um, the evolution of uh, Filipinoness in America, I gather. So all right, so. We should talk about your article because. Uh, All right. <laughs> <laughs> but so it goes back to the the whole colonizer joke. Yes. You know, I. All things start with the colonizer joke. Yeah. And because you, you joke about it because it's too painful. Mm-hmm. But your exploration in this came because you were wondering why weren't there any Tagalog offerings? Right. Why? Yeah, I think there is there was a lot of factors over the course of. I mean, definitely starting when I was looking into Harvard as a school and just noticing that that language was not offered. Um, and also a lot of the history courses were not offered. They just, at the time, I couldn't really place it. It just, it, it collided really nicely with like my own personal shame about not being able to speak the language um, and and like the kinds of work that I had not put in. Um, and so for a while, I just like internalized that, right? Like, oh, it's not their fault that I don't know how to speak Tagalog. Like that's on me. Um, and I can't blame Harvard for it, but to some extent, like, while I do acknowledge that there's, there's like work that I need to put in as a second generation, um, like Filipino, you know, member of that kind of diaspora in this country, that there is also like looking into it now, a very intentional, like erasure that was carved in that area. Harvard offers a lot of languages. It offers like, I know someone who was taking like a Norwegian class that had only two people in it. So yeah, Harvard Harvard will have like Norwegian language tutorials where they only have two people in them, um, or it teaches languages that are functionally dead, like Latin. And a lot in a lot of these cases, like no one is fighting tooth and nail to get them. It's like there is students have expressed an interest, and Harvard's like, okay, we'll find to make it work. There's been generations of Filipino students at Harvard who have been consistently petitioning to make this language wow. happen, and always gets just shunted from side to side. So there's a lot of confusion about Southeast Asia in general. Obviously, like the whole question of like the racialization of Filipinos, which you brought up earlier, is a whole nother thing too, because of like the different colliding legacies of colonization and like the geographic area. There's just a lot of confusion there, but like. Like Thai is housed under um, like South Asian languages, but Vietnamese is housed under East Asian languages. Um, and so anything within, you know, vaguely Southeast Asia or any kind of island in the Pacific is, there's a lot of confusion institutionally about where that goes, but even thinking just like numerically about how important Tagalog is. And I know that Tagalog is not the only language spoken in the Philippines, but it being like the most prominent one, at least in the United States, um, at a certain point, it was like, there's, this cannot just be like an act, accidental oversight. There's a much larger story here. Um, and so that's when uh, I'm, I'm kind of rambling on, but it's just such Sorry. a long story of like. <laughs> yeah, no, no, things. it's good because it, it's part of the evolution of getting to this thing that's bothering us all these years. And, you know, it, it, it hits you as a, as a Filipina of mixed race. You know, I mean, you look like all my kids. My kids are all mixed race, Caucasian, Filipino. You've yeah. heard the old joke, you know, cockapinos, right? There you go. <laughs> and, uh, it, you know, and so, but they deal with it in a different way. They don't, because, I don't know, maybe it's because your your mother, you're close to your mother, so they take after, you take after, well, I don't, know, I, I don't want to dish your father, <laughs> but, but my kids, they see me doing my Filipino thing, and they say, oh, that's nice. Dad passed Olympia, and then they they hang out with mom, 
And and so, but anyway, it, this is something that we are all still dealing with for generations. Mm. And maybe it's that imprint. The colonial imprint still is very strong. Yes. Yeah. And I would also say that um, for as much as like within discussions of Asian America, Asian Americans and like Asian American studies, there's a lot of, there's definitely an East Asian leaning focus, right? Which makes asking questions about Filipino identity um, in the United States really difficult because it doesn't look like, I mean, I wouldn't say that there is like a typical trajectory, but it, it is definitely a, a distinct kind of racialization that occurs in the United States. Um, but there was one book that I read and it informed a lot of the first op-ed that I wrote. So this, this piece was like longer form. It was once I had like some of the ammunition to start getting directly at Harvard, but the original one that I wrote in the fall that informed this one was, was before I had any like material evidence. It was just, these are two collisions of things, American right. colonialism and this lack of course offerings. And there's some kind of lack here that's really like causing a degree of discomfort with me. And so that was informed by, um, there's this really great poet and essayist, essayist, Kathy Park Hong, who wrote a book called Minor Feelings. And so her explanation of it, which is almost exactly what we were talking about in the beginning about like, you can only really joke about it, right? Because you know that there's something wrong here, but you have been made to feel like it's not something large enough to be an actual statement of discomfort. You can only make jokes about it because it embodies like your sense of discomfort and lack and also the acknowledgement that it's going to be instantly dismissed. That's the perfect vehicle for humor. Um, it's so, painful too, right? Yeah. I, I mean, and this is why, you know, I gave, when I gave the Ivy oration in 77, I come out there and I start talking like my, like my father, mm. who's sitting in the front row. And I start talking in my version of the Filipino tongue, which is not Tagalog. It is because the Ilocano Tagalog, you know, mismatch in, you know, languages and, or not mismatch. It's more of a collision. They had to speak English. So I end up speaking in accented English. And I, I just went on for like a minute mm -hmm. talking like that because I was going for the joke. Yeah. And as soon as I break into, and now I talk like this, Harvard man. Oh, man. The, uh, the laughter I got was like, it was more than anything I'd ever felt in my life. It was like the, it was, you know, it was that, it was that affirmation that made me think, well, that's weird. I only get joy and approval through laughter, which a percentage of those people are just saying, oh, of course, that's what the little monkey can do, right? Mm -hmm. And then some of them are saying, oh, how revolutionary is this little monkey? But more are saying, oh, what a, what a, you know, I hope his speech is over soon. So mm -hmm. I held him for 45 minutes and then I, then I sat down. But, you know, but that's true. We, we want to joke because it's so painful and it's our only avenue sometimes. Yeah. Only and arguably, avenue. I think some of the dialogue too, to turn it from a joke into like a serious discussion is not present. It's definitely not present within like the Harvard side. There's not, there's no institutional acknowledgement of a lot of this stuff happening. Um, and so you can say things like, oh, Harvard's a colonizer. And most people are like, what, what the hell are you talking about? Right. Like, yeah, we, they don't know the history. I mean, and then also like yeah. on the other side of the very particular kind of colonization that the United States did within the Filipino context of, of education, then the dialogue is also in some ways like not present within the Filipino American community because that's exactly how it was designed to like be this, this hidden, um, you know, force that is, is perpetrating a lot of erasure um, without ever being in, to like name it and acknowledge it as a site of like a wound and not necessarily something that's just like a benevolent gift placed down upon the Philippines. Yeah, it was like a, this was the beginning of that kind of benign brainwashing, right? Mm -hmm. um, which is colonization, colonial yeah. mentality, whatever you want to call it, but it's there. So this was your explanation, uh, your exploration. This is how it begins. You got the material and then, you know, with the Tagalog, where's the Tagalog courses? And then you went into it and, all right, so the pictures. You got a picture of the hiker oh, who's, in, yes. who's in Cambridge. I, I've written about the hiker and 
it conflates all the things. This shows the ignorance of America, right, and the ignorance of American education because it conflates the Spanish-American War with the Philippine-American War, and it combines, you know, the death, and then, oh, what the hell, let's throw in all the other things, you know, Cuba and all these other other things. Also, like, let's just show a, a native Filipino woman just kneeling at the feet of some servicemen. Like, oh, let's tie in the whole, you know, sexual exploitation of women in, like, around army bases and whatnot. Yeah, well, and look, and they weren't really military. They were hikers. They were just, they were just white guys out for a jaunt. They were, and if <laughs> whoever got in the way, civilians, you know, any kind of collateral, you know, we'll just, we'll just kill them. And then here are the numbers, and they conflate the numbers. And so, and the hiker, of course, is not only at Arlington Memorial Cemetery, it's all over the country mm -hmm. in places, you know, Midwest, Texas, even in California, and right there in Cambridge, where you have a picture of it. Yes. Yeah, I didn't know about the hiker. I didn't know about the hiker in the 70s. I, and I just learned about the hiker a couple of years ago. Yeah, I, I'm not sure how long that particular statue has been there, but when I was writing this piece, um, I wrote the first one and then it was like the day that we published the first op-ed, everything just kind of like descended on me. I had, we had like a, a picnic, um, a start of the semester picnic with the Filipino club. And someone was like, oh, I heard that you're like publishing this op-ed tomorrow. Here's Stanley Carnell's book where he says that like Harvard was direct, Harvard affiliates were directly responsible for this. And then another um, stu uh, fellow undergraduate at Harvard, his name, his name is Jeremel. He's also in the Crimson and he's like doing incredible work in this space as well. Um, but he was like, oh, yeah, there's also this statue on the way to the quad. So also within the Harvard realm, like it's yeah. on the way to literal dorms. Like people pass by this every single day. Wow, it's, it's, it's right there because I, I wrote a column about the hiker on the ALDEF site, the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund. And my thing was, you know, they're taking down Robert E. Lee. They're taking down all these statues. We got to take down the hiker. We got to take down the hiker every, everywhere where the hiker has like spread his little, you know, dropped his seed. Right. We must take him down. And a friend of mine, I'm only in touch with just a handful of people from my class, just a handful. But one is still in Cambridge and he got excited because he's into public art. He said, yeah, let's take down the hiker. And then we got into the pandemic and then we didn't take down the hiker because we were America was coming, was falling apart. Mm -hmm. But, still good, but yeah, we can still do it now. Now I, I know that there are like a, a cadre of Filipinos who yes. are willing to take down the hiker. I'm gonna, I'm heading out to camp. We're gonna take down the hiker at some, at some point. We're gonna declare our, 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 our being back in the world, out, out maskless and without, without. We're gonna take down the hiker, and it's just one by one, you know, one city at a time. Mm -hmm. anyway, it's all around 128 too. It's not just campers. You can just do all Boston hikers. They're all like a family. <laughs> anyway, so the hiker. All right, so I saw that and I said, oh, yeah, this, this is the history people know about. When was the first time you heard about Emilio Aguinaldo? I mean, not that you have to mention in your article, but, I mean, that's usually the context that people see a paragraph. And then there was Emilio Aguinaldo, and he became president after, you know. That's it, one paragraph. If that. Yeah. If not also in a sea of like, look at these insurrectionists. That oh, yeah. The guys <laughs> put down. Oh, the insurrectionists. January 6th made me think, oh, wow. I wonder if there's a Filipino. And of course, there was a Filipino there with his broom, you know, in, in the crowd. But, you know, that's that was sort of like the the homonym that got me when the January 6th stuff happened mm -hmm. that, oh, yeah. How do I know insurrection? The Philippines. Yeah. So, uh, what? So the, all the history. What kind of? When was the first time you got a sense of your Filipino history? In college? In high school? Did you get? I would anything? actually say, um, it was middle school. And this is because, in in the ways that I think a lot of students who come from like minority ethnic or marginalized backgrounds are always forced to like take this initiative upon themselves to find their own history within schools I, I i think like growing up you learn very quickly that the things that you're going to learn within like a regular history class um i came through the entire public school system of, of oakland public schools and i have a lot of love for it it's probably the most like you know 
like leftist radical friendly place that you're going to get in this entire country. And so there was a lot of like work being done with like incorporating ethnic studies within classes, which is, I would say, a bit more of a recent movement, though. Um, but still, regardless, like even knowing how how good Oakland is with this kind of like looking beyond traditional whitewashed history, um, there was still a lot of work that I had to do on my own. And so when I was in middle school, we had um, this project where you would like basically just write a little textbook off of a country in Asia. We were, I was in world history. And so we were like bouncing around the different continents. My sister before me had done the Philippines. I had done the Philippines. It was like one of those, those generational things where the Filipino kids always do the Philippines because they're trying to piece some, together some pieces of history that they weren't able to find anywhere else. Um, and so within that history thing, like that's where I first got the sense of like, oh, look, Spain was here and then America was here. And then everybody just kind of stopped talking about it because you know, Japan did yeah. its its occupation thing too. And suddenly everybody was friends after that. So that was, that was the beginning, I think, of a lot of some questions. I know my sister had done the Philippines and she'd been talking with some adult in that she like didn't cross paths with again, but she'd said something about like the U.S. having colonized the Philippines and the adult was like, no, that didn't happen. And she was like, yeah. what are you talking about? <laughs> there, there's a lot of denial. You know, when you talk, like I did this uh, women's show about Harvard and colonialism and you know, about going back East and my friends who are Asian American, they would say the Chinese, they'd say, you know, people don't know this story out here. They're just totally ignorant. I said, well, I know about it as a West coaster, but I'm sure only because I was a West coaster who maybe read an additional chapter or, or, or stayed after school and read right. a little more. But for the most part, most people don't know about the, the colonial history and and as you point out in your article, back to the article again, it's almost probably that intended isn't. to be that way, right? We forget about the history we don't want to talk about. We don't want to mess with it. Yeah. Except you messed with it. <laughs> you, you, <laughs> you, you, you know, and so back to the article. So, so the history, you, you know about this history, you know about the scars. Mm-hmm. And then what made you go back into the uh, go back into the stacks? I mean, I went into Widener to find all these. They must have been pensionados coming after the 30s, and they wrote their dissertations, their PhD, uh, you know, dissertations and unpublished, unpublished theses. They were at Widener when I wanted to take a course in uh, the Philippines. Right, you couldn't. You had to take Fairbank and Reichauer's course on Asia. Fairbank was the ambassador to Japan or China, right? Reichauer ambassador to Japan, Philippines. Oh, what's that? You know, you got to go deep into the sections, and you get a section leader who says, "Oh yeah, you can write about the Philippines." Great, no books. I'll just make it up. <laughs> I'll talk to my mother. <laughs> I'll, I'll ciders an original source. Primary sources, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But I went into to Widener, and that I had the, sort of the same experience about mm -hmm. Filipino immigration. But you went really back into mm -hmm. the stacks to find out more about colonization. All right, so tell me about what, how did that dawn on you that I gotta I gotta look further into this. I mean, Harvard has a role in this, mm -hmm. and I gotta go into this other section of Widener, the Pusey section, where Emil didn't even have the privilege of. The Pusey section in 1977. Yeah, I am not gonna lie. I was getting angry. I was getting a little bit, a little bit heated because oh. there was it was this like thing, this this void that I'd been sitting with since I had decided to apply, since I had gotten in, since I had first talked to my grandmother, and she'd been like, "Oh, we never heard of a Filipino going to Harvard." That there were just a lot of things combining. Spring happened. The Atlanta shootings happened, and Harvard's response was laughable. Um, they sent like three different emails from deans saying like, we promised to stand with their Asian students. Um, the, the mental health services on campus released a, a statement under the guise of therapy that was like, we, um, we know you might be feel ashamed of feeling Asian. And it was just like this whole thing where it was like very clear that Harvard did not have the structural capability of like reckoning with the legacy of US imperialism. And so that's when it first started ticking off in my head, like, okay, so if they can't deal with like this whole entire, like putting the pieces together of the Atlanta shootings and putting together the pieces of like the spike of hate crimes that are going on right now, then there's also something here um, when it comes to these courses. And so after summer going through, um, and talking with other Filipinos on campus, I 
and having like written a couple of other papers and other classes on like the history of US colonialism in the Philippines. Um, I knew that like I had that one line, my friend had sent me like a scan of the Karnow book on the one, the one section that says that Elliot was responsible for appointing or at least like provide like delivering Atkinson to, to the lap of the president so that he could be appointed as the, the director of education. And so I knew at that point, like I was gonna need to see Atkinson's book yeah. because that was where like the Harvard's fingerprints were gonna be all over that one. Um, because and, and of all the different ways. And you're talking about in your in your article, President Charles Eliot, class of 1853, mm -hmm. and Harvard graduate Fred Atkinson, class of 1890. So he's fresh out of college, really. Fresh out of college. And Eliot is saying to Taft, who is the uh, he's the uh, the governor, right? Wait, no, he he was, yeah, no, he's president at the time. Mm -hmm. Taft, but Taft was former governor of the Philippines, and he's going to uh, create this Philippine Commission. And on it's almost like this was the colonial LinkedIn, you know, where, where, they, find, yeah. where they, find, <laughs> they find each other and they say, oh, well, this guy Atkinson needs a job. He'll go to the Philippines. And he ends up as essentially right out of college with running the the education system in the colonial Philippines. Mm -hmm. How yes. does that happen? And there's, I mean, there's so many different aspects to that too, where like in the creation of this, this colonial education project, it was also like it directly derived from a lot of principles of um, domestic at projects of education, right? For indigenous students, for black students as like a form of racialized assimilation and subjugation. And there's like, direct like treatises on performing this kind of education so and is so, it is it to me but is this any different from the the native american schools that were going on i mean it was conceptualized in almost exactly the same way and of course like i wouldn't go so far to say that it was like a carbon copy of the things but there's there's like a book written by like um, a woman in the department of education Catherine cook who was like yeah so all of our territories and then all of our like minorities within the country let's 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 see how they're doing um and let's all perform this this kind of education upon them um, as, as the best way to extend empire. Like she says, the schoolhouse follows the flag. So there's there was already a lot of acknowledgement within the American government that like education was gonna be an absolutely necessary tool for all of these projects simultaneously. So you're, you're discovering this, you see Atkinson's book mm -hmm. and you see what he wrote. He says, the influence of this American teaching body has been a profound one in the work of pacification which our government has been fostering. And when you read that, what, what, what goes off in your mind? Honestly, things, I can't say I was surprised, right? It was like being confirmed in something that I had known was there, um, but just having like the quote to back it up at this point. And so that whole process of, of entering PC, and I explained it a bit at the end of the article, but. Right. PC is a really industrial, sparse library. Nobody goes down there. It's like in the bottom of the earth. Right. Um, you have to take like six elevators <laughs> to go down there. And hey, I worked at Widener growing <laughs> up. I mean, uh, part time, I worked at the library yeah. and I worked dorm crew. Of course, dorm crew, right? <laughs> They're going to name a broom closet after me at Harvard. <laughs> so, but you're right. It's like you're going deep, deep, mm -hmm. deep into, you know, things that they want hidden and an industrial or an industrious scholar mm -hmm. student is going to have to like really yeah. want to know this stuff. And yeah. so once you did, you, it, it was a smoking gun, right? Yeah. It was a bit overwhelming, honestly, the whole process, but in a good way of like, this was a full circle moment that needed to happen. Um, the way that the whole thing went down was so cinematic. Like I had to press these buttons and like wait for the shelves to run apart. They're like floor to ceiling shelves. So you're just watching this like giant, like stones unrolling. I enter, there's like the Spanish, um, like manuscripts from their colonization on one side and like the entirety of the American side on the other one, I'm just like walking through this pitch dark hallway. You have stools like lined up in there so you can grab the stuff from the top. Um, but yeah, and then grabbing that book and opening it up and being the only person in that space. And I went back there to take pictures for the article again. And like the shelf that I had opened was still the only one open in the entire library. So nobody goes down there at all. And so just like having that, that 
trove of information just seated in the heart of Harvard's like most iconic Widener library was, I think, I, you know, there's, there's not a lot of words to say exactly how that felt. Uh, you know, I, I got to that paragraph in your article. It, it just, like I said, it reminded me of, there's something I need to know and it's in there at Widener and it's buried and I'm going to have to find it because I'm going to have to write that damn paper. And when I went there and saw it, I was like, why doesn't everyone know about this? Mm -hmm. You know, you, you, you really want to shout from the, you know, from the mountaintops, right? Uh, like, Hey, this, this happened. And then, and then you go out and talk to your friends about it and they, oh, yeah, yeah, go, there you go. they don't believe, they don't believe you. They, and, and so, you know, I, I can't imagine now, now you got the book, you know, what, when I read that, I started looking, I've been doing some, the Filipino students out at UC Berkeley have been protesting the names of buildings. All the names of the buildings were named after people who served on that Philippine commission mm -hmm. and had a role in uh, the colonization of the, the Philippines, including the education. David Prescott Barrows, uh, who was president, I think from like 1915 to something at UC Berkeley, he was, he came after, after uh, Atkinson to be a super a superintendent in Manila. And mm -hmm. I think it was because of the connection Atkinson served along with Bernard Moses, who is a social studies guy at Berkeley. And then when I don't know what happened to Atkinson. He probably said, well, there must be a, a mutual f or a hedge fund I can run instead. <laughs> or I could, be, I could be a VC somewhere instead of, you know, the head of education in the Philippines. That's the least resistance. Yeah. Harvard's favorite. <laughs> right. So, you know, the, the thing is, um, the uh, Barrows stepped in and he wrote the book, The History of the Philippines, that the Filipino kids had to read. Mm. They said, this is your history. And, you know, it's it's sort of like you know Jansen's history of art, or you know that everyone reads in Fine Arts thirteen. I don't know if they still have Fine Arts. <laughs> That's an inside uh, Harvard thing, or you know Samuelson's Ecten book. You know, mm -hmm. this is the book that all the Filipino kids who were colonized had to read. Right. And it it just, it, you know, I I realized that God, I I left a lot on the table when I was. <laughs> When I was an undergraduate, I mean, my mind truly would have been blown had I gone deeper. But I was just concerned about why is my life so f because, you know, my because my parents and the sex ratios. And yeah, but I think that's still like incredibly important work as well, too. And it also is like definitely there is there is such a privilege in being in the like per the generation that I am in where like I am not the one concerned about survival right now like I am not the one who just moved my entire family to this country and is like doing their damnedest to get their kids to the ivory tower if that's if that's the goal or to the white picket fence or whatever so I have the privilege to be mad about these things and to be cynical about these things um in the way that like I know different different layers of dialogue and, and generations look very different yeah I mean you talk you have that bit where you talk to your grandmother I mean, I, I gather your grandmother was the first here and she came in like after the war? Um, my my grandfather came first. My grandma followed him a couple of years later, but they were, I think, mid 70s. Oh, mid. Oh, after Marcos. Marcos. Yes. So you're you're even late after Marcos and also after the Immigration and Naturalization mm -hmm. Act of 65, which is exactly. like open the door for everyone. Mm -hmm. So a little wait in line, but you got in. Yep. That's your grandfather and grandmother. Mm -hmm. And then your mother was born probably, what, in the 70s or 80s? She was born in 68, so she was born in the Philippines. She moved over when she was in third grade. A real Marcos baby. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> mm -hmm. and, then, and then you and then you, she meets your, your, she goes to Berkeley. You told me yes. in, in an email she went to Berkeley. So an educated Filipino American at Berkeley and they had Asian American studies. And was she into that? She, so she is a civil engineer. She mostly stuck with like that side, but she was definitely really involved with um, the Filipino group on campus. And so like a lot of her college friends, like my, I call them Cal 
Cal aunts and uncles, my Cal cousins, but they're all from that group. So there was a pretty tight knit circle there. Yeah, great. And so she she meets your 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 father. They marry. They get they have you. You grow up in Oakland. I mean, it's really you know you are that this is assimilation, right? Is. This is colonialization right. working, right? Grandmother comes, mother comes. Here's the offspring. You go to school in Oak Public Schools. You didn't go to Head Royce or Collegiate or anything like that, <laughs> right? Yeah, good. Probably what Skyline, something like that. The skyline, yep. skyline, you know, Tom <laughs> Hanks's high school. Okay, there we go. <laughs> there you go. Uh, skyline, the Lowell of Oakland, sort of. I think that's that's actually pretty fair. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, I went to Lowell, so you know, I, you <laughs> know, uh, but you know, you're you're like this. You're the outcome of the colonization. You're supposed to be. You're you're the good result. Yes, I am the Mestiza Harvard education like poster child right now. Right. And, you know, and look at me. I mean, I had my father came in the 20s, long gap, no, no, no family. Then, you know, baby boom, Filipino baby boom, World War II. Then I come, you know, after the Civil Rights Act in 64, they Harvard allows, you know, enlarges the pool. When I was at Harvard, I, I think I and I mention it a lot now because I want pe people to know that in the 70s, you know, there were some Filipinos who weren't aligned with the Marcos dictatorship who were there at Harvard, who were um, American. Right. And because the Filipino American gets left out, the pure Filipino, two parents, mm -hmm. Filipino, they get left out. And the Filipino American, both parents Filipino experience becomes no different than the immigrant experience, which is like, don't we get to skip a step? No, no, you get to live the immigrant life, yeah. which is what I did. And even when I was at, at Harvard, I mean, senior year, I lived at the co op, so you know what that means, right? Yeah. You know, <laughs> I'm sort of already kind of. Oh, Dudley House marginalized. Okay, yeah. All right, but, you know, cool kids were there. We cooked our own food. There we go. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but, but I stand, but, you know, formative years, Weld, Leverett, you know, Yard, River, you know. But then I dropped out. Mm. Dropped out to be a DJ in Houston. But I had that, you, you call it gap years, right? Yeah. We just said, ah, oh, you got Got the AP classes, take a year. <laughs> we call it a gap year because we may never have returned. Yeah. <laughs> we may not have returned, but the guilt, the guilt got to us. Oh, I guess I got, I, I was playing, uh, I was playing Loggins and Messina on the radio. Please come to Boston. And my father calls on the request line and says, oh, aren't you going to go back to school? <laughs> okay, I'm going back to school. Next caller. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so. But, you know, it, it, but it's funny, um, you know, we, we live with the consequences of the colonization and it's not really well known. And, yeah. and you're, like you said, poster child. Yeah. I mean, you're, you mentioned in the piece, you had to cry, you know, when you sat down to write and you had to, you were somewhat procrastinated yeah. because it was no, emotional. Like, the affective process of writing that piece was a lot like it took a much greater physical toll on me than I thought it was going to. Um, because I think like finding out about the information already was a pretty big deal. Like I called my sister and she was like, what are you doing at that colonizer institution? Like what the hell is going on? <laughs> but even just like holding on to that, right? Because it was, it was this balance of like the feeling of that, of indebtedness that a lot of Asian immigrants, Filipino immigrants, especially given the kind of colonization, like that balancing that along with like the knowledge that this was an important piece of information that I had to get out the right way but also it wasn't just like some objective you know fact that I had dug up about somebody else that I was going to like put in a piece it was like this was preordained it made a lot of things in my personal history make sense um within my family's history within the history of this community make a lot of sense um and so like going through it it would it would take a lot more out of me to sit down and like type out a page throughout the course of three months than I thought it was going to and then after it was done I just like lie down on the ground and like after we published at 2 30 in the morning um on the night before i had a final exam the next day like i lay down on the ground and cried for an hour and then i was like all right let's let's keep it pushing uh, look you know you wrote that 
uh, you know, for however long it took. But you imagine how people had to live with it and who still write and express in the media how some of us feel because it is a story that does not, that people don't, like you said, don't want to, yeah. to let out. And it's, you know, how many times are you told that, oh, you know, no one's going to buy it. No one's going to want to read that. No, there's definitely the additional difficulty of explaining, like, why it was a bad thing in the first place. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Why are you hurt by this? Uh, look at you. You know. You got English, right? M middle class life. You got a job. You know, it's like you got, like in my father's case, oh, you got food and clothing. Hey, you, you, you came here. And, and, like, we didn't let you have a wife for so many years, but ultimately you did, and then you had a... There we go. And you ultimately had a family. And so what if you're you were 50 years older than your, your, your kids. I mean, Mick Jagger is 78 years older than his kids. And he, I mean, look, and look at the difference. Uh, see, see, this is the thing. It's, it's like, uh, I, I know I joke about it because it's so painful. And so I related to what you said. I, you cried when you sat down to write the piece because it's always when you're in this situation, there's so many workarounds, right? It's all, it's all workarounds. It's like mm -hmm. the software isn't very elegant. It does not say first, you know, oh, let the Filipinos in. That's not the first go around. It's like several computations later and mm -hmm. then. Right. There's always so much more that it stems back to as well. Yeah. And your choice of the word preordained. I, you know, I have to say, you know, th this is very well written, very poetic. <laughs> you know, very, very, you know, you just it's more than just factual, but very poetic. And the, the choice of preordained, I thought, was interesting because very Catholic. Mm, yes. <laughs> very, very Filipino. And very Catholicism. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, you don't mention Catholicism very much when you said preordained. I mean, uh oh, <laughs> she's going to become a priest or a nun here somewhere? Or, where did mm -hmm. I miss? So I, I just like thought, fun. yeah, but was... the guilt, the guilt, you did feel guilty, huh? You felt guilty yeah and i mean there's so many emotions wrapped up with it where like there's there's of course the guilt that i had for like being a bad filipina in the first place for needing to ask for this this class in the first place right um then there's the guilt of course oh, wait of, a minute wait why would that make you a bad filipina because you shouldn't have asked for it is that what you're saying or because like just in like the very bare bones sense of me not having this knowledge to begin with, mm. right? That like, I know objectively doesn't, isn't true. Um, but from, from the sense that it like, it wasn't, it was a knowledge that, that I didn't grow up with, right? Does that make me not Filipina enough? That kind of ah, guilt. The absence of the information. But as you point out, when you read Atkinson's book, you say, quote, I was holding an archive that was designed to never touch my hands. I was seeing something that I was never meant to see. And now you can't unsee it. No, I cannot unsee it. <laughs> right? Yeah. How do you deal with it? Yeah. That is the question, I think, that the, the when I was writing this piece, um, Part of it, I, I knew that I needed to write it as soon as I found it. Um, and so I did I did what needed to be done. Like I actually ended up enrolling in a class in Asian American studies and ethnic studies and anthropology class um, at the college, essentially so I could write this piece as my final project. Also because the content was like amazing. I love that class, I love the professor, but I knew at the end of the day, like it was gonna be because I needed to write this piece as my final project and in conjunction like with, you know, my role in the Crimson. Um, but, I was going somewhere with that. I just completely lost my train of thought. You you had to take this class and yeah. because you had to get the information so we can get you in a better pay, place so you can understand your role as a modern American Filipino. Yes. And also um, when we were in this class, though, my classmates and we were like running through some of the work, like workshopping parts of it. Um, my classmates were just pressing like, what do you want out of this? Right. Like is is it like bringing something to the academy really liberation? Is that really like the end all be all goal that you want from this? Do you just want 
like this class to be taught at school? Do you want an apology from Harvard? Like, what do you want the next steps to be? And I think that's a, that's a big question that is not just for me to answer, of course, because this was the culmination of a work of a lot of people. Like I needed to have other people like, you know, push me in the right direction for some of these first sources. When I was reading through Atkinson's books, like other people had already annotated the most important sections. So it wasn't like, I'm the one who like answers this question definitively. What do we want from this? I think from a baseline level, like there is just, a community sentiment that like, we want this class. We want to learn Tagalog. Almost every single Filipino that I run into at, at Harvard is like, oh, I loved your piece. I've been wanting to read Tagalog the whole time. There's like a, there's a pretty sizable mixed race contingent where half people are like, yeah, I, I resonated with a lot of the shame that you mentioned. I want to learn Tagalog as well. Um, and people like putting those pieces together that it's not just a personal shame, that it does stem from like a larger historical thing that there's there's more than one aspect to that, to this, this want and this lack. Um, but then I think it also brings in the question, like, when you have this information, like, what is the next part? Like, what is the conversation that you could open up with Harvard beyond just like, please give us this class? What is what is the next movement? And that, like, I think it's open. I think that conversation is open to all people who have stake in this discussion. Yeah. I mean, you you live it. And based on what you, you do, I mean, if you go into the corporate world, you, you got to wonder, well, where are the Filipinos? You know, I mean, it. It's all about opening up, right? Mm -hmm. Information, and then as we get more information, then people come in, and then we get we live in this diverse world because it's informed by real information, history, and not by our ignorance. And we're all happy, and we have a love interest in one another. And isn't life great? That would be the ideal. Mm -hmm. It takes generations, though. It <laughs> and you know. And you say, I quote, I am pained by generational loss in this space and yet cannot help but feel joyous at what I have the resources to know, to learn, and unlearn alongside others in the Filipino-American community. So it is this kind of bittersweet thing. It is. That definitely is. God, you know, and do you, you got to change the colonizer now that you know that you're in there, you're in the belly of the beast, not only in the belly of the beast, but you're in the inner intestine of Pusey to there get all this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, how, what do you want to do to Harvard? I mean, you're, you seem to be on a good track, uh, you know, being editorial comp director. That's going to lead you somewhere. They've got a, a new Hispanic woman leading, uh, leading uh, the Crimson. Uh, you know, I like the crim. I comped. I comped for. Mm -hmm. I did. Sp I wrote sports. I wrote water polo stories, and I wrote sports columns. But I, I didn't get. I didn't get in because I was also comping at the Lampoon at the same time, and I got oh, in there, and that was like that, that was more fun. That was more fun. So, uh, but you know, but all the crimson guys, you know, and gals, they go yeah. on and you know journalism. They, yeah. oh, but they do things, all right, and not just journalism, but when they're bored with journalism because they say, oh, you know, it's just journalism. <laughs> I want to do something more real. But that's the great thing about journalism is being like skills are so applicable. It is, so it is. I mean, but I, I thought that you, you would know you, best of anyone, but <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, you laid it out here, and then ultimately, toward that last section, you talk about the forty-five million dollar gift that Harvard got, which is like that's like a big deal. 45 million. The, but the Asian American alum who are on, all in high tech, you know, they need to launder their money some way. So here it is. Are Passing they going to. Yep. And, th and this goes back to this idea that is it when people see Filipino, do they see Asian American? Exactly. Yeah. And so, I mean, part of this piece that was difficult um, was thinking of how much of like the other, there's there's so much in here that needs to be discussed. And so there's a section where like, I could write a whole article on colonial mentality. I could write a whole another one on like the notion of indebtedness. I could write a whole another one on the fact that like Filipinos are not considered mainstream Asian Americans. And like that perpetuates a, a certain kind of harm upon the community and like its visibility and whatnot. Because it would even be um, like someone was asking me, are you, gonna, are you gonna be able to effectively like convince people on the East Coast that Filipinos are Asian when you're asking for this money? Um, you know, there's there's a Filipino woman who was also brutalized during the course of the COVID-19 hate crimes. And similarly, like in Oakland, there's a lot going on oh, yeah. where like elders within the community, Filipino and non-Filipino alike, were facing a lot of these like just 
the, the, the racialization, that's the way that it was occurring, even though it doesn't like map on to the traditional like Asian American trajectory because there is this history of colonization, of American colonization in particular. But there's also some things that really do align like the history of US imperialism generally in, in all of Asia and the Pacific. Um, that makes this conversation like a lot more richer than just like the few hyperlinks that I could scatter in there um, for like lack of space, of course. But I'm, I'm hopeful that there is there is like space within this dialogue to, to really make clear that Filipino studies, as much as it is, it's it needs its own special attention, right? Because it's not it's not like there's so much more to the conversation than just the last I don't know 40 years when it's been on the census as Asian. Um, that it's still very necessarily part of this expansion that Harvard is about to go through, that it does need to be included within this particular realm and like within the money that has just been thrown at Harvard to, to rectify a lot of these gaps. Yeah, I mean, they, they don't really have an Asian American studies program, truly. I mean, it's kind of like, yeah, you can study it and here's a group of people, but it's not a real department. Now, here's the thing. One of my classmates, I had a lot of classmates, who, uh, who are, are more famous and more powerful and richer than I am. But, all right, so besides Gates and Balmer, who were in my class. Oh, nice. <laughs> but they don't talk to me. <laughs> They're the colonizers. They're the digital yeah. colonizers. <laughs> but uh, Ali Asani, Professor Ali Asani. Yes. We used to have, we used to eat together. You guys were in the same class? Yeah, we used to eat Wait, together. this is so great. Like, really quick interjection. One of my blockmates, yeah. um, his name is Ali, yeah. And loves Dr. Asani. Like oh, they're yeah. best friends. And so I think that like seeing oh. this kind of like, generational pipeline, <laughs> it's so awesome. Yeah, Ali was ah oh, man, when we were sophomores and juniors and seniors, I mean, there were there was this alienating time, right, where we would, you know, we'd go into Leverett to the, the dining hall and we would who would we sit you know what it's like. Mm. Who do you sit with? Here, here, here. And it was always like Ali and I would always end up together. And it, it, we went to one of the reunions, and it was the same thing. It was like, mm. who do we do? We end, and, you know, I love Ali. He's uh, he's one of the few people from my class I, I just, you know, keep in touch with and emails. And and so, but he, he has an interesting uh, background as an Asian, well, now American, but Asian – South Asian Indian who grew up in Africa, yeah. now in America, and he never left Harvard. So, yeah, he had to like it a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> no, he, he he had mentors. He had people that he could rely on. But yeah, uh, Ali would would tell me that Harvard's not close. You know, it's like he called it a big elephant that just mm. moves slowly. It and, does. Uh, but now with this money. Maybe right, and a little bit faster. Maybe, you know? <laughs> but it, a lot of it has to deal with you know the Tagalog. Do, will they? And not, let me ask you this: Forget about the politics of the educational bureaucracy. All right. Do people, you know, like when I, I I was last at Harvard like four years ago, and there was a big uh, Vietnamese sandwich truck, food truck mm -hmm. out by the science. Is it's that still, still there? there? Yeah. yeah. Boy, you <laughs> know, if that were there when I was there. I would say, God, I feel at home. Here's a, I get a, I get a Filipino heart, I have a Vietnamese hard roll sandwich, and I feel like I'm in downtown Oakland, Chinatown. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah. So I knew it, it changed, and and Harvard is like twenty, like they just, uh, uh, you know, uh, and the early admits, right, twenty six percent Asian, yeah. and probably the regular class is going to be about that. Yeah. So Harvard is now like the most diverse Ivy, which isn't saying much because it's an Ivy, yeah. but it's, it's something. Like yeah. It's definitely a very big change from when you were there. Yeah. And, and so do they look at you and see Asian? Excellent question. <laughs> yeah. I just have the questions, not the mm -hmm. answers. I mean, I don't know. Do they? Yeah. I think that, well, that also brings up, that's a different question for like, you know, Mixed race Asians. Oh yeah, and, mixed race. Yeah, but, uh, like I, I birthed a few. I birthed three yes, of them. So I, exactly. <laughs> I, know, I know about um, that. But also, I, I do think that like it, which communities you lean into, right? Like which legacies and which histories you lean into, um, do 
do define like the way that you're you're seen right like I think I'm pretty vocally Asian or at least Filipino on this campus um and so yes I would say yes um but that also requires like a, a degree of very like intentional forthright like make sure you think about this community when you're thinking about Asians American Asian Americans Harvard because I know you won't otherwise I know this is not um something that that comes naturally just like generally when thinking about Asian Americans within the United States but also like particularly with Harvard because it has its own very like you know its own kind of myopia yeah I mean it's true I mean they don't th they don't think about it unless you're pushing unless someone is pushing yeah and so here it is it was the most read story in the crimson for like several days I mean that's gratifying as a writer, but do you yeah. think it had real effect? Do you think it began to change how people saw not just Filipinos, but also some of these issues in Asian American studies? I'm hopeful. I'm very hopeful for that um, because there was a pretty like a large explosion on social media afterwards, which I'm very grateful for that like people that I knew, but not just people that I knew were like sharing this post with one another um, and there's, of course, it was making its way like within the Filipino community, but beyond that, people who like had never met Filipinos before, before they had like read this article or who, they're just people that would come up to me in the dining hall and be like, oh yeah, I had a Filipino friend at home. I didn't know that this was what it was like, or like just it, the conversations were being had or people would share it with the caveat or not the caveat, but they'd share it with the caption, like learn something new today. It was, people were aware that like, this was a conversation that they'd never heard before, but were actively taking the time to engage with it rather than just being like, oh, headline, I don't understand that. Let me just move on. And so I think it got like, the degree of, of like starting a kind of conversation that I wanted it to, of course it's ongoing though, right? Like there's this, it's great that this, it got the traction um, that, that I was hoping for. I'm also hopeful that it leads to something actually material, that there's some kind of deliverable that like now that there is this consciousness beyond just like the group of 15 Filipinos that make Lumpia together, you know, the night before we all leave campus, um, that this can then go into something that like now when we bang on Harvard's door as you know one of my my I call her my author but she's my my big sib within the Filipino organization is like going to the language department and has been doing it for the past three years banging on their door being like where's my Filipino class she has like an article in hand and she has people behind her who are like we've heard about this thing that you're doing or that you're not doing more accurately and where it comes from and now we're ready to open up this real actual conversation and that's what it takes, you know, like uh, Martin Luther King said, you know, you're not going to win it on the, the, the battlegrounds, you know, the streets, you're going to win it in the front pages and on the, you know, the, the evening news, you got to arm people with information and when they see it, cha changes their minds, hopefully exactly. something changes. So, God, you know, I, uh, I, I'm, I'm really glad that I bumped into the article. I don't think I would have uh, <laughs> seen it if I hadn't been reading something about quantum physics, which I, I really, I, I only, like I said, particle, wave, spinning metaphor. liquid wave. You know, <laughs> that's all I know. That's all I know. I don't, I, I, it's a metaphor. I, I don't know. I don't know the science. But, it, but then when I discovered this article, I said, wow, I'm glad that someone is pushing this. And whenever you want to take down the hiker, you let me know. I'll be out there. We'll get, get out <laughs> yeah. the hacksaws. Juan pulls up. <laughs> <laughs> Take down the hiker. I think so. We'll bring Dr. Asani too. It can be a whole little yeah. It's be a reunion. A reunion. <laughs> you know, actually, uh, Harvard is given up on January, right? January and February, they're yes. like every. You're like everyone is. Yeah. They're shut down. And as a as a class of 24 who like did the actual all of last year virtual, I'm really hoping, praying that they don't move the rest of it online. Wow, that's true. You are. You did all of last year at home and this year you could have part of it so how is how is harvard <laughs> did you did you like it so i would say thankfully i i was actually on campus last fall they brought all the freshmen on but just the classes were virtual and so it it was what it needed to be at the time right like it was a great experience i met some of my best friends that i'm still like they're my blockmates now and i'm going to be best friends with them for the rest of my life and that's super great i think that was like a particular opportunity afforded by like the trauma bonding of of having no right. casual friendships like you were either best friends with people and did everything with them or you didn't because there was no bumping into people on the way to class or bumping into people on tables at Annenberg. Um, but for better or for worse, I now have really good friends because of that. I lived with some of them off campus in Boston in the spring. And so coming onto campus this fall, I at least had some sense of like how things worked. 
but there was, it was like being overwhelmed with really good things. Like, oh my gosh, dinner takes two hours now because you're just talking with people the whole time. Like I have to walk to class. <laughs> I'm in Adams, so I'm not even that far from things, but I'm still like generally five minutes late because I think I have so much more time than I actually do. But it was it was a great experience. And ret only in retrospect, can I really be mad about what my freshman year looked like? Because I didn't know I was missing out on so much. But sophomore year, sophomore fall was in the end, everything it needed to be. Yeah. Um, and so I'm very, very happy with the way it turned out. Well, I can imagine. And you're running the comp now for the editorial page. And so, you know, you're, you're going yeah. places, girl, <laughs> you know. Thank you. And uh, so, you know, like if you ever need like a like, you know, an easy, like 10 page paper, you, can short, you should write about the ethnic media in the Filipino community mm -hmm. between the 70s, pro Marco or the anti Marcos to, to today, because that's kind of interesting mm -hmm. uh, because it's in the ethnic newspapers, spe specifically the Filipino ethnic newspapers, where you heard a Philippine voice all throughout anti Marcos, all throughout you know, Corey Aquino, People Power, all throughout Duterte. It's it's a consistent kind of, well, either it's, you know, sy sycophantic or it's, you know, you hear something that's real commentary. But it's an interesting uh, aspect of the media that is not known mm. that is, like, I don't know how many Filipino restaurants you go to in Daly City, but, you know, they're all there, those <laughs> Filipino newspapers. Yeah, and then <clears throat> as far as the diaspora goes, I write for uh, uh, the Inquirer dot net, which is the Philippine Inquirer's uh, website, uh, based in Manila, but they they put out things for Filipinos all over the world, and so I write about North America, and it, it's just interesting because I've done it instead of my mainstream career. I mean, I've had some mainstream success, but most of the time, the stories that have uh, sustained me have been the Filipino ones, you know, where mm -hmm. you talk about uh, Filipino Americans, you talk about us and about what, what we're doing or what, what's happening to us. And I still think that in that case, the ethnic media, specifically the Filipino and the Asian American ethnic media is kind of like the first draft, right? First draft mm -hmm. of history. Um, I know uh, some Filipino scholars, uh, the late Don Mabalan, who wrote Little Manila's in the Heart, which is about about Stockton, California. She relied heavily on, uh, you know, ethnic newspapers. So anyway, I, I just think that, that that's an avenue if you want to find, oh, this would make a great thesis yes. <laughs> for, you know, ethnic studies. What were the, what, what was in the, not digital, they didn't have digital media. They had, it was hard, you know, hard copy newspapers. And, you know, Filipinos in the Philippines, they love newspapers. And mm -hmm. the ethnic, in the ethnic communities, they also love their newspapers. And they just give them away free. And they, they, but that's how, you know, people communicate. Did I not ask you something that you wanted me to ask you? I guess I pretty much covered every, you've been talking for an hour. Damn. Yeah. I think it's been a very, very fruitful conversation. I, I, I think, I think it has, I think it, it has been really C congratulations on this. And look, if you ever want to talk about Filipinos, we should do a, um, an old generation, I guess that would be me and uh, <laughs> a, a younger generation, Filipino American podcast, where we talk about stuff happening in, you know, you know, some, some of these issues. Right now, on my on my uh, Emil Amux takeout, I talked to Dan Gonzalez, who was one of the original uh, professors in the College of Ethnic Studies at San Francisco mm -hmm. State. He was in the strike, 1968. So I remember that old time. He remembers me. So we talked to each other about stuff. And I like to talk to him, but, you know, so we skew old. But it's mm -hmm. nice to have someone young, you know, who I can call on and say, well, what do, you th <laughs> what do the young people think about this? Is it on TikTok? Oh, no. It, <laughs> it, because, yeah. you know, I'm beyond Kuya. I'm more Lolo now. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not. Uh, I yeah. feel like you could be at like Tito level though. Well, maybe. I. But, you know, it's like, uh, well, look, all right. Um, thanks again. And, yes. and and good luck to you. And Thank, thank uh, you so much for having me again. Uh, you're welcome. Take care, Eleanor. You as well. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Tito, I, I like that, the Tito effect. 
Not a Lolo, a, a Tito or Tio. I, I never got into the whole uncle this, uncle that kind of thing. But uh, yeah, it, it kind of fits. Not a Kuya, older brother, but more like Tito level. That's fine. Elner Wickstrom, a Harvard student, editorial page editor at The Crimson, on the need for Asian American Filipino history everywhere. And that was quite an article. Go to the show notes and I'll put a link to her article. Uh, really eye opening because this is an open secret this history, this colonial history in Harvard's role. And nobody, no one, really knows about it. But hopefully that'll change as more people are required to learn about ethnic history, the ethnic history of America. And that's our program. Hey, thank you for listening. Check out our live stream. The show is on Monday through Friday, 2 p.m. Pacific. It's live on YouTube, Facebook, on Twitter, at Emil Amok. That's E-M-I-L-A-M-O-K. And recorded on amok.com. But this, this is the classic podcast. Sometimes we kind of intermingle things, but most of the time, the podcast is the podcast. Get it wherever you podcast. Emil Mucks take out. Thank you for listening. I'm Emil Guillermo. One, 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 one,